it. Let's go ahead and get going. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Want to welcome you to uh, one of our fellow uh, webinars. Um, today, we're going to talk about deformity correction techniques. We're going to talk about uh, pediatric uh, due rotation uh, and balance, as well as adult uh, sagittal plane correction and balance. Um, it's a little bit of kind of uh, how I do things, and um, we're lucky enough to have our fellows uh, from UC Davis who are going to help help me with that today. Um, my name is Eric Kleinberg. I'm from uh, uh, UC Davis, uh, and my two partners in crime uh, this evening are Trevor Carroll. Trevor, uh, raise your hand there. That's a handsome devil down there. Uh, and then uh, Steven Swinford, uh, both of them are our current, uh, these are our two current uh, spine fellows and really have done an outstanding job uh, thus far this year. We'll see how it goes in this webinar for their uh, uh, their final grade. Um, here are my disclosures. I think uh, Trevor and Steve are still looking for some disclosures. They are interested and available. If anybody has anything that they would like to do and uh, uh, maybe I can give you some of mine. Um, none of the disclosures have anything, anything relevant to do with any of these talks. This is our agenda for tonight. So uh, we're gonna just uh, you know, say hello to one another. Um, we're gonna go through a case and then look at some AIS derotation, derotation techniques um, and then uh, have a little bit of a discussion and then same thing uh, for adult form kickstand distraction techniques. Now, one of the cool things that we're doing for the first time here, and we'll see how this works. So I'd love your feedback when this is all completed is, uh, we're going to use some of the spine stud models, uh, which we worked on yesterday, instrumented, um, and then did the live reduction with them. So you can see kind of the techniques. We'll run some videos as we do it, uh, kind of talking through that technique. And so um, I'm hoping this will be kind of uh, fun for everyone and a, potentially a good learning opportunity for all of us as well. Um, I also want to remind you all that we have uh, two other uh, um, uh, webinar topics coming up in March. We'll talk about solitary spine mats, uh, workup and treatment. And then on June 16th, we'll talk about uh, AIS, uh, deformity kind of uh, uh, how to treat and, and uh, level picking levels. I also wanna encourage you uh, all uh, to uh, ask any questions you might have. Uh, we'll look, be looking through your question answers through the Q and A uh, function. Please submit any questions you have um, like I said today in clinic, there are no stupid questions. There's only stupid answers. And so we'll do our best to give you those uh, uh, answers. Uh, both the fellows have worked hard on their presentations and uh, I think we'll be able to give you some pertinent information about correction options for deformity and then also go through some tips and tricks that they've noticed that uh, we use here and that uh, they've also picked up as uh, potentially useful for them uh, down the road when they head off to their uh, new careers and new jobs. Um, again, welcome you guys to the webinar and uh, I hope this will be a fun, interactive uh, uh, time. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, Trevor, why don't you go ahead and kick it off and we'll start off with uh, AIS uh, deformity and uh, some derotation techniques. There you go. And just to uh, unmute yourself too, Trevor. There, good. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is a scoliosis case, uh, pediatric. Uh, it's going to be sort of a hybrid. Uh, we're going to combine uh, a case study that we did and then also uh, that uh, model that we talked about as well. So this is a 13 year old with a AIS. Uh, she was neurologically intact. There's nothing wrong with her, uh, except she had uh, some uh, scoliosis. And so here's her, uh, her films. She had a hundred degree uh, mid thoracic curve and uh, like a 34 degree uh, thoracolumbar curve. Um, here are bending films. So she doesn't straighten out all the way. Um, you can see on the right, she still has a curve on the bottom. Um, so we'll talk about kind of what we did and things I like to talk or things that, uh, we find useful, but, um, this is her, uh, in the, in the surgery, uh, we use a bilateral femoral tra uh, traction and then we use the Gardner Wells tongs as well. I, and I, 
you can't measure this obviously in the OR, or at least I don't know how to, but uh, it's, it's pretty nice act, uh, afterwards to see how much correction you get you know, going from 100 to, to 56 on, on the bed. Hey, hey, Trevor. Oh, perfect. I wanted you to talk about picking levels. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So uh, picking levels, I guess these are just kind of take-home messages. Uh, usually the cob to cob is, is pretty good, but uh, other things you want to talk about are, uh, or other things you want to think about for your upper instrument uh, uh, level is uh, if, they're, if their shoulders are level, then you can stop at T3. If the left shoulder is high, uh, then you uh, go up to T2. If the right shoulder is high, then you go to T4. And then really, you, know, you just get the bending films and then you correct anything that uh, stays over 25 degrees on the bending films. Um, I don't know, there's a little okay. new model. I don't know if this is helpful or not, but the L kind of looks like a two. So that's how I remembered it. I, th I think the other thing too, just go back to that real quick, Trevor. And so the other key thing to, to think about is, is what, what we're really talking about is how much you correct that proximal thoracic curve. And so if the proximal thoracic curve is rigid, then it's gonna push up that left shoulder preoperatively, in which case you're gonna need to go up and grab it. So this is really, uh, just a marker of that uh, of that proximal thoracic, but it will do a nice job of um, making sure you get those shoulders level, and patients will notice that after surgery. Um, other things for screw choices, uh, uh, the system we use has uh, evens or uh, whole sizes, so uh, we use uh, six O screws for pediatrics, seven O screws for adults. If you have a, a half size system, then uh, you probably go to six five. Uh, other things that are helpful are to use the uh, uniplanar screws. Uh, that helps with your derotation as well. Um, you do have to be a little bit more conscientious about your alignment with the, the screws. Um, so it's helpful to line up the, uh, the uh, screws a little bit uh, better than uh, just using the polyaxial screws. And then uh, when you're using the uniplanar screws, the head turner actually just turns the whole screw. Um, and uh, we don't use tabs, we just use uh, regular uh, uh, pedicle screws. Uh, we also use uh, the 6.3 millimeter uh, cobalt chrome rod. It's basically the stiffest rod that we're, we can get our hands on. Uh, we also like to use hooks at the top, uh, help uh, decrease the risk for uh, PJK and decrease uh, the stress riser. Um, also, I find it kind of helpful if you place uh, your hooks before you put in your screws. Those can be kind of hard, uh, especially when you get your upper thoracic screws in. Um, general ideas, uh, so most curves are going to be a lanky 1B, uh, so the right shoulder is going to have a hump on it on the Adams uh, Ford Bend test. Uh, and the concave side is going to be on the uh, yeah, the concave side is going to be on the, the patient's left with the convex side on the right. Um, and so for the left side, you're really pulling that uh, curve out. And so we use a higher metal density. We put screws at every level on the left, typically. And then on the con, uh, convex side, we don't use as many. Hey, there's, there's a question in the, in the chat about using mono screws at the apex or at all levels. Mono block screws? Yeah. Good. So, so we use uniplanar screws. Yeah. And so that allows a translation uh, north and south, but not medial lateral. Uh, mono screws are really a fixed angle bl uh, block screw. We use those for trauma, but we really don't use that in, in uh, deformity correction. And then we use uniplanar screws at every level. Some of that is for ease of remembering, but it also allows us to untwist uh, the spine, particularly down at the bottom, and Trevor's going to show you that nicely. Um, other thing, I guess this is for people that haven't done a lot of this. Um, there's it seems like there's a lot more axial rotation uh, deformity than in adult stuff, so it really you kind of have to be mindful with your trajectory and, and, and help looking at all your uh, bony elements posteriorly is helpful. So, uh, medial lateral orientation, you can look at your lamina, your spinous processes. Uh, for superior inferior, uh, contralateral transverse process is helpful too, and uh, kind of line things up perpendicular to the uh, superior articular process. Uh, we do facetectomy, so those are available. Um, so this is a model. This is uh, one we used yesterday. This is uh, 
pretty helpful because they, they it's 3D printed and the it has the deformity in it as well. Um, and then this is uh, another thing that we like to do is uh, differential rod contouring. And the idea is that that left side for that lanky 1B, you're really pulling the curve out and the right side's pushing it down. So you uh, hyper exaggerate the, uh, the left side and then you under contour the right side because the right side you're pushing it down. Um, other things that are kind of helpful reminders are uh, T10 to L2 are usually pretty straight. Uh, you can mark those when you're going to the back table. Uh, usually makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, we prefer the hand benders over the French benders. Uh, just uh, ideas that have less acute stresses over the, uh, the rod, although we do use them occasionally. Um, and then you just want to be mindful. Uh, those black lines that we have on the rods kind of keep them oriented. Um, and then when you're uh, cutting the rods, uh, we keep that little nib on the uh, inferior side or the, uh, the lumbar side. Uh, and that, that's how we uh, uh, put them in. The, the, the French bendering too is a, um, it's a good technique to learn how to use. Um, it has really saved my hands, you know, a bunch of the, uh, all, all you fellows, you guys are young and uh, got big, strong hands. And let me tell you, after doing this for uh, 15 years, your hands are pretty sore at the end of the day. So anything I can do to decrease the stress on myself is, uh, uh, is pretty helpful. Um, so this is, this is one of the videos. This is, uh, so the concave side is going to have a, a screws to every level, the convex side. We actually, I put in screws at every level, we took them out to show what we do in uh, real life. And then, uh, so we just take the template and then we just sort of put it over the screws to uh, quickly get a, a number. And then, so this is us uh, yesterday and then I, I sped this up uh, times two, so hopefully it goes a little bit uh, faster. Um, so we do the proximal thoracic curve and then we really give it a good, pretty good bend over that middle thoracic segment and then some lumbar lordosis down there at the bottom where that nib is. And then this is the right rod. So the same proximal kyphosis, but then we really want less kyphosis in that middle segment, leaving that pretty straight, just enough to kind of gently tell it where to go. But uh, you can see a huge difference in those two rod contours. So then there's the picture. Um, so just kind of helpful things and. We'll show you in the video, so I'll just go through this quickly. But uh, we start with the left rod. Uh, we start with uh, superiorly. Uh, we place uh, the rod inside as a closed uh, hook. Uh, and then we don't uh, place the set cap on that until all the other uh, uh, screws are in. Uh, we use uh, clips to help uh, reduce the rod uh, to the screws. And uh, we do an early derotation. So after a couple of the clips are in, we, we try to rotate the, uh, this, the rod uh, so that it's oriented in its uh, final uh, position uh, earlier than putting all the, the set caps on. Um, and then we, this is just bringing down the rod. And I think the point here is that what we want to do is place that first left convex rod, and you'll see it in the video that that rod's really sitting way, way high out of the skin. and. So what you want to do is slowly bring it over, slowly translate uh, the spine to the rod, uh, and that's going to slowly tighten out that rod. And, but you'll see pretty quickly we grab the rod, insert it, and then swing it over into a better position. So there's from the top. So we'll give it a provisional lock at the very top part of that construct. And you can see it's not even in the skin. It's sitting way off to the side. Get it locked over. and then bring it all the way off to the side. And you can see it's not even in the skin anymore uh, in that middle segment. Most of the times when we're first starting, 
you know, you look at that rod and you look where the spine is and you go, there is no way we're going to be able to hook that all together. And just through slow, gentle translation, we'll slowly bring that rod back over in place. And usually the, the, uh, the poor resident or medical student, whoever's holding that, uh, that hex doesn't realize how much force and how much work they're doing to help hold things in place and allow uh, things to translate in the right location. And here is another trick. So sometimes uh, we can't get the, uh, can't get the tulip over to the rod. And so we'll use a hook holder to grab that rod and bring things over. And get those in place. The video is moderately nauseating. It's the best I could do. <laughs> it, uh, let me fast. As you can see, you can see we're slowly dilating the spine over. You see that clip? I can't get that clip on. And so we'll translate the other portion of the rod until we can engage the tulip. Now that tulip's engaged. Now we start driving down that head get things locked in place. And we kind of work towards the apex. Again, whichever ones look, look screws look like they're gonna help us. And if you notice, we always have uh, two on each side that are helping drive things and hold things together. Now we're gonna to work to the top. Bring in a clip in. Driving that rod down. Trevor, any any tips you found while doing this? Anything, um, anything you found that's particularly helpful? Or I uh, I I think it's helpful um, to take a marker and mark the uh, end of the rod right before the hook, just to make sure you have enough rod length. Uh, it's a pretty annoying to do a lot of this uh, reduction and then find out that you don't your rod's not uh, long enough or that it slipped out. Um, but just kind of going slowly and, uh, I don't know, I put on there, uh, fix it like a, a flat tire where you're just kind of going sequentially and, and trying to reduce it. Um, and you can see already the rod. So now the rods being, the spine is being translated over to the rod. What happens is that the, uh, that actually the rib deformity gets worse, uh, not better as the spine comes up in concert. And so that spinous process is still sticking way off to the side, bringing that rib up. And so that's why that right rod has to be so flat as to press down on that uh, right side. And you can see we've just about gotten everything all lined up here. And, and the key thing when you're advancing this is really making sure that you're not losing any of the fixation in the pedicles. And so I'm scrutinizing those the pedicle tracks next to the the rod while we're bringing that up. Um, you can see we're generating a tremendous amount of force on this. Uh, it's bending out some of the curvature of the rod um, and Trevor's working pretty hard there to hold that rod straight up and down as we continue to. Well, the model's pretty light. It kind of lost some of its uh, uh, derotation. It, it is helpful, I think, when we put the rod in first and trying to get it so that it's oriented, um, then you don't lose that derotation. Yeah. And one of the questions, Trevor, is uh, how do you decide the amount of contouring the rods? Arbitrary measurement based on normative thoracic or lumbar curve values? Uh, there's probably some of that in play. But then you also look at the x-rays and kind of see how much the patient is. Uh, they're usually pretty hypokyphotic. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I think the other thing that we also pay a lot of attention is how, re how good the fixation is in the spine. And so the better, if I'm able to put very good screws that have excellent bony purchase, then I'm usually more aggressive in my thoracic kyphosis. Um, I would tell you over the years, that's something that I have been more aggressive with my contour and particularly in that convex rod is much more aggressive uh, because I know that I'm not going to get screw pull out. Uh, I think when I first started, I was a little bit more timid. Um, and so that didn't, that mean that meant I didn't have to pull out screws. Uh, but it also meant that I probably got uh, not as great a correction as I could possibly get. And then here's the other side. Yeah. I think it's the same rod. Is it? 
So, so just this is I, so I like this video here on the right where you can see how much more prominent those right sided screws are. And so we have not we still need to take that right side of that rib prominence and push it down to straighten out that rod. Um, the other thing that we'll do is we will lock. So before we let go of that uh, left rod, we lock it in place mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that it doesn't spin out while we're messing around with the right side. Trevor, why don't you talk through putting the right rod in? Uh, right rod's a lot easier to put in than the uh, the left rod. Uh, you can They're use both them. hard. They're both hard. Don't undersell it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But you can use the, uh, I guess the naked screwdriver is what we call it. You don't need to, the reduction towers as, as much on the uh, on the right side. Um, really, here is the correction maneuver. So, yeah, so locking it proximally and then driving it distally. What that does is bends the rod over that apical right-sided rib prominence with screws and then pushes that down. And that that's really what flattens out that kyphosis and presses down on that rib pump so substantially. Yeah. And then, you know, I guess being mindful of where the wrench is, you can help, like you made it a lot easier by lining up all the, uh, the screws over the rod. Uh, so look, this, this video is about half as long as the other one is just cause it's faster to do. Yeah. And we, and there, there are some people that we use differential metals on both sides, cobalt chrome on both sides, cobalt chrome on the left and then titanium on the right. I tend to use the same metal for both sides. Um, and uh, the reason I do that is often I can take one rod and cut it in half, particularly for a, um, a, 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 a selective thoracic fusion. So it, it saves the hospital a couple of bucks um, if I can do it that way. Uh, it's an interesting, the other thing too, is that when you're bending one rod, it's hard to differentially bend two rods and different metals. I think you're it's just hard uh, uh, brain activity to try to figure things out. And so there we are, we're just kind of balancing the spine, getting the screw corrected and getting things tightened out. All right, so Trevor, those are, so this is our first derotation maneuver. Now you can see how much that right side, now the rib prominence is gone. And so we've done about, what do you think? 50%, 70% of our derotation and correction by now? Yeah. So something like that. And then, then uh, the last segment. Yeah, and then we're then we're uh, then we're going to do is do the uh, sequential uh, distractions, compression, as well as derotating it. Uh, there's all different ways of doing it, but we like to kind of do it in the same step on the, uh, each pedicle. Uh, it's helpful if you find the neutral vertebrae. You can lock that down with a final tightener. It's usually somewhere between uh, T8 T12. Uh, if you're not very good at knowing what the compression distraction levels are, like uh, me, uh, then preoperative planning is uh, helpful. You can just put arrows and stuff, and uh, it's uh, then you don't have to like look at the spine. It, it does get less obvious, at least in my eyes, uh, once all the rods are in, and it's a little bit more subtle. Uh, so if you preoperative plan, it's pretty uh, significant. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna make a comment about that too. So it, it's. You know, what you want to do is it's obviously a distraction through the convexity, compression through the concavity. Um, excuse me, the other way around. Distraction through the convex concavity and compression through the convexity. And so just think about you want to dig those screws that are right next to one another, separate them out, increase the working length. And really what I look is just for side to side. So I want the right screw and the left side to essentially balance each other out. And I, I think that, that that's how I try to figure it out in my brain as well. But I agree with you, it is complicated. Once you, once you start getting some of the corrections, sometimes it'll, you'll get confused as to which way you need to rotate. Um, and then, so we do one pedicle at a time or at one screw at a time, um, and we'll show you the video. Uh, you could use couplers or the, I guess it's called the sandwich, but uh, like a global derotating where you, you uh, put them all in one device. Uh, this kind of helps because if you just do the sandwich, I guess this is biased, but it, it tends to undercorrect it. When you lock it in, it tends to have some memory and go back. So with this way, you can really get as much as possible and lock it in and it still kind of flows back. But usually when it bounces back, it's hopefully in a more neutral position. Um, and then we just start from that neutral pedicle screw or the neutral uh, level that we found. 
And then uh, whenever you're doing this, just you know, make sure your screws aren't pulling out. Uh, and then this is just kind of for me, but take the time with the derotation. It's uh, patients are happy with their uh, coronal correction, but uh, they really are more, most concerned about it. Seems like their ribs or their, their shoulder uh, leveling. Um, we also, when we're doing the uh, compression distraction, uh, we just use our hands. Uh, helps us kind of keep better feel. Idea is to have a lower likelihood of blowing out a pedicle uh, if you're constantly holding on to it. Um, and then after you do the compression distraction or the derotating, then you uh, tighten it again. Uh, so that, because uh, the amount of torque when you're doing that, it'll, it'll uh, still tighten. So we just get a sense about where the rods are in space. So we're gonna pick that neutral vertebra and we'll go ahead and tighten, lock that down. And I'll work a little proximal first. So the left side, we're gonna put two rods. We do our derotation and get some length to that mid thoracic spine. And so there I am levering forward. You can see the tubes are in two different locations. Now we're gonna work a little proximal again really pushing one rod against the other. I usually don't go higher than around T6 or so, uh, just because I think on that upper part of the thoracic spine, I think it's, uh, it's a little risky. Um, and I don't think you get a big bang for the buck. So here we are now derotating down the lower segments. So I do the distraction first to get a little length. If you lose signals here because you're lengthening the cord too much, uh, the answer is you need to back off and then do the shortening. So do the right rod first and you can compress. Um, that uh, can be tolerated a little bit easier for the spinal cord, particularly if it's a really big curve. Uh, so we've done it a couple times. You can just see the amount of derotation we do. And then I usually leave the very last segment until the very end because that's the one I really try to spin back the most uh, so that it gets things corrected. So there is the, so that was the, left rod and now here's the right rod. And so this side is gonna get shortened. And again, we try to put that rod holder so it's out of your way so you can see it. So Trevor can get over top of the screw easily. Put a little bit of bone in the way. or plastic, derotate, mega, compress. And so on. And then down here in the lumbar spine, I really just go now for balanced screws because I want to level this out to the pelvis. Now that we've leveled out the shoulders, we fixed the derotation, we fixed the rib hump, we've taken this pretty massive curve and shortened it up. Now we're going to scrutinize the derotation down in the unfused segments and get that last instrumented vertebra to be fairly level. So I think we end up doing a little bit of distraction here on this side to go ahead and lengthen that lower column to balance out that L, whatever that is, L3 or L4. I can't remember where we instrument it to. So we distract one side, compress the others. The goal is end up with those screws balanced there at the bottom. The balance went up top. And then here's our final derotation. You can see that right rib prominence is really down. Boy, those pictures look nice, Trevor. And so then this is the, uh, the lady from uh, earlier, um, got her down pretty well corrected, so. So screws in on the left side all the way, right side you use to push down, balance those shoulders. And she still has a small residual curve down at the bottom, but we've left her with, you know, three motion segments. So a little bit of a curve down there, I think is probably, probably just fine. Yeah. All right, that's what I have. Any, uh, it, Trevor, any, any tips or tricks for other fellows trying to do this on their own or thoughts about it? Um, anything you find particularly challenging? Go slow. I like that plan. I like uh, being cautious as you're placing screws. It really is dependent upon 
great screw placement. We place all our screws freehand. Uh, so you get a real sense about how that cancellous bone feels. Uh, I mean, so there's no evidence, right, that the amount of correction has any impact on long term. So I think when you're starting out, or at least when I'm starting out, is uh, maybe don't rip out like nine pedicles on your first time. Uh, so, you know, I guess it's like you know, all the other spine surgery stuff, be safe. And Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's perfectly, I think that's uh, totally accurate. And, and I also think as a young surgeon, uh, there's no evidence that saving two motion segments is uh, worse than three, worse than four. So uh, fuse long, get nice corrections. And then as you get more experience, then start using them shorter and being more aggressive. I think that's, I think that's excellent advice. All right. Carter, that was great. Thank you very much. I don't think you mentioned the last uh, step is usually locking those hooks. You leave a lot of pressure off those until the very end, just make sure you're not over stressing those. Yeah, tighten yeah. those. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, Speaking of Steve, let me stop. Yeah. Steve, why don't you go ahead and go to your thing. There's a question about higher density screws to the apex. And the answer is, um, I really, on the left side is really the most important piece. The right side is, is more of a, is much more of a pushing down maneuver uh, rather than uh, a pulling up maneuver. And so, uh, no, I, I, one or two, one, usually I do like an every other screw construct on the right side, left side usually gets uh, every pedicle filled. I think the other thing that allows you is when you use a 6.0 screw with a beefy rod, uh, it allows you not to do a lot of pontes. Yeah. So uh, it might be faster. I don't know if that's true, but there's probably less blood loss if you're not doing a bunch of pontes. Although we still do them if it's bad. Yeah. I think the big curves, I think a ponte is still a good idea. I think the small ones, it's not unnecessary. Um, and then I, I think there's, a, you know, obviously every time you put a kerosene into the canal, there's a risk. And so you are, you do carry some neurologic risk with the ponte osteotomy, so you just want to be careful. Um, other question, last question, and then we'll move on to your portion, Steve. Is there any change for the thoracal lumbar or lumbar curves in terms of technique? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that question means, to be honest, but um, I think the question is, is do, how do we derotate that as different distal segments? And the key part is uh, at the screws of the very distal portion, I usually over rotate them the other way. Um, uh, to uh, to spin those around, um, and so that usually helps correct those those other segments and cre correct that unfused spine. So that usually works pretty helpful. And I'd say you know we probably do. What do you think, Ponte Osteotomy? Do you do those in ten percent of cases, maybe less? I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. All right. Not the true AAS. Yeah. All right, uh, Steve. Why don't you talk about some of the adult uh, techniques? Sure. You guys see my screen all right? Yeah, looks great. All right. So I'm um, Steve Swinford, UC Davis. As Dr. Kleinberg mentioned, no relevant financial disclosures, unfortunately. Hopefully someday. Uh, so I'll do the same sort of format as Trevor. We have a case discussion in the middle. We have some of the technique description. So 58-year-old gentleman, uh, chief complaint of severe left sciatica. He had a prior L3 to S1 decompression about four years prior. Did well for two years and then has had two years of worsening back pain and left lower extremity ridiculous pain down to the plantar aspect of his left foot. Uh, he has a history of HIV that's been treated and bipolar. His only surgical history that's relevant is the prior L3 to S1 decompression. And on exam, he has a normal motor and sensory exam. He's got positive sagittal balance and relatively neutral coronal balance. And those are the long-standing films. And we uh, kind of zoom in a little bit. You see he's got a 35 degree right thoracic curve and 35 degree left lumbar curve. By convention, we always flip the uh, AP image so that the left is on the left uh, as we're gonna look at it during surgery, just for future x-rays. You'll look at spinal pelvic parameters, uh, pelvic tilt 25, pelvic instant 65, lumbar low dose is about 50 for a mismatch of about 15, and he's about 11 centimeters positive. Uh, out of this MRI, just to show kind of how uh, abnormal his lumbar spine is, clearly compression in multiple levels throughout. He's had prior surgery, um, and I think clearly has reason to have this sciatica. Uh, interesting point that I wasn't really aware of before fellowship. Frequently, it's at that fractional curve down at the lower aspect um, where they experience it. So his left side where he's got that 
uh, left convexity. Yeah, that's good. So, that's, that's, Steve, that's such a great point to, to I'm just going to reemphasize that again, is that really the fractional curve is where all the problems are. So that's at the L45 and 51, uh, really where it's being compressed down. That's where you see all the problems. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the part that you need to straighten out, think about inner bodies um, and correct uh, to, to free up those nerve roots. So that's great. So I wrote out our goal of surgery, obviously decompress the nerve roots that are giving him symptoms, restore his sagittal balance and correct his coronal deformity. So I guess like if we had done a poll, we could have seen what people would like to do, but we decided to do a revision decompression of three to one with a new uh, primary decompression at L2-3, uh, push your column osteotomies from L2 to S1 to allow for better coronal and sagittal correction, and a T11 to pelvis, push your spinal fusion with a T-lift at 5-1. Uh, we routinely will do a T-lift at 5-1 on patients we're worried about healing, just to get that extra bony surface to heal and prevent pseudoarthrosis uh, down at the base of the spine, I think. And Dr. Kleinberg's clinical experience, he sees that's really the only uh, or the more frequent place where things will break down if they're going to. Yeah, that's what the, so when I look at my rates of rod fracture, um, they're pretty low up to about three to five years. And then I start seeing fractures at L5S1. And so uh, I, I think there's, it's just a high stress zone. And so I become more and more aggressive about instrumenting and uh, in placing inner bodies there for that. So these are some intraoperative images. Here you see our uh, wide decompressions, pontiosteotomies throughout, and then we instrumented. Uh, order of operations is dealer's choice. We uh, like to do the hard part first and then uh, place the screws after that. Uh, intraoperative fluoro showing uh, that we place an additional iliac bolt on the left side, um, a little teardrop view. We do not do a S2AI, we do it all uh, in the iliac. Uh, it's starting at a medial aspect of that overhang at the SI joint and aiming out towards the greater troke. So we use, um, I believe they're 80 by 100 millimeter bolts on both sides. This secondary one, I think was a 90 in this case. Um, it's a nice long corridor as long as you stay inside the bone. So here's a, quick view and I'll fast forward through the parts that are not terribly interesting, but to correct that fractional curve and kind of get a head start on our correction, we do a little rod rod distraction technique. Utilizing that accessory uh, iliac bolts is sort of the anchor that we'll uh, push off of. So we have an initial rod that's got a little lumbar lordosis contour to it. That's only gonna be uh, connected to the iliac bolt. It has a little domino side side connector that we're threading this uh, second rod through that'll be uh, connected to our thoracic screws. Uh, we chose to use three at, in this instance. And this part's less exciting. So get them engaged and we'll show it. We lock the set cap down in the electric bolt because we wanna be able to push off of that. And then kind of hand tighten these upper ones to what Dr. Kleinberg likes to refer as white knuckling. I usually don't torque those upper bits just because I worry about stressing too much stress on those uh, pedicle screws. So we'll kind of white knuckle two or three screws. So you're not just pressing against one screw. And then this, what this whole thing allows you to do is really push that whole spine out of the, out of the concavity and, and take that all that fractional curve off. So here we're showing that we now have a fair amount of rod here that we can grow um, and push up cephalad. So we'll lock this uh, connector onto the uh, upper rod and then you'll see a pretty nice example of the correction that can be achieved through just using a rod holder and a distractor. So we'll tighten this and then torque it. You just want to make that one rod and that one cross connector all one piece. Mm -hmm. and then that rod holder, again, to 
lift everything out. And it's always amazing how much this moves. You can see that whole spine now lengthens all that foramenar open. That concave curve has now been all corrected just with that one pretty simple maneuver. All right. So now that we have this provisional correction, uh, we'll go on to drop our rod onto the left side to hold it. And this is just a standard technique. Uh, again, Dr. Lambert likes to lock it into the ALAC bolt just to make sure we don't lose our rod as we uh, reduce it down. Uh, you'll see that the fellow cut this rod a little bit short, but I think it's still illustrative of what we're trying to show. Uh, that was a little quick, but again, using the reduction towers, rod holder, uh, and sequentially bringing it down, making sure we're not putting too much stress on any one screw at a time. And this it, is helping the, build in our lower doses. And the key, you know, obviously would first for this, the case, we would have done the inner body first, um, done that 512 lift, then go ahead and pack the bone in the inner body space, and then uh, go ahead and do this and compress so we make sure that everything holds in place. Uh, and then the key things you'll notice is I don't put a uh, a set screw in the top screw because uh, I really want that to be no stress and um, it's bent down into that tulip so it's really pushing down on the spine uh, to make sure we decrease our rate at PJK. Okay. Um, I, I think that's also that's also critical. That's where you corrected me from putting a production tower on there. And zip through that a little bit. So now we've basically locked in that initial correction that we have. Now that we achieved using the kind of rod rod distraction technique. And then we can go and do the contralateral side. Again, similar steps. I think everyone here is comfortable with this. I think the keys are just making sure you line up in the tulips before you. Uh, reduce it down and be thoughtful about the order in which you're doing things. Uh, I do like that little tool that you have for sliding the rod over to the tulip um, and sort of the coronal plane. I think yeah, it's little... very nicely in Trevor's. Yeah, that little hook holder is kind of a little clever device to kind of grab the tulip and kind of nudge it over. And then here, there's still a bit of a derotation down in that lumbar spine. And so we still are pulling up uh, some of those screws to get everything lined up nicely uh, together. Again, I think that that uh, that actually also helps indirectly decompress those neural foramen, uh, which I think improves the neurologic recovery after surgery. All right. So now I've got both our rods in. And these are the ones that will be doing most of the work. And then after we do our derotation and uh, sequential compression distraction, similar to what you saw in Trevor's talk, we can then utilize that ex accessory like bolt to further strengthen our construct. So we use this little side side connector um, and have a slightly under contoured rod compared to our uh, primary rod, partially to um, get a well, that's where you hulk out and make your assistant look weaker than he is. Um, <laughs> but you can uh, get some better geometric uh, stability by having an out of plane rod to help uh, take off some of the stress from the primary one. And we also under contour it because it reduces the amount of uh, notch fatigue that it sees. So in theory, it should be more resistant to rod fracture. So lock it into the AVAC bolt, loosen this little connector, it slides right on and you can tighten it in place. The other nice thing is if you is if you have a complex three dimensional deformity of both coronal and sagittal plane problems, then you can use the the tip of that. You can see that that rod is still hanging out the top, and so you can loosen the distal screws or proximal screws and lengthen or compress that right side of the spine to do any fine tuning. And, and that sometimes is a pretty clever way to get a couple degrees one way or the other. 
uh, to make sure that you've got things lined up together properly and, but, and not have to take all of the implants out. So uh, again, kind of using as a true kickstand technique. All right. Here's a little uh, example how we like to bend rods for our adult deformity, similar tire iron technique. Uh, this initial bend is to help get from that S1 up to the iliac bolt. And then we try to bend in the lower lumbar curve here. And we're just in our mind's eye imagining where uh, we'll see kind of the L4 and then the L2 to L4. And then we flip it around. This is where we're bending in that little bit of kyphosis to drop the rod into that most cephalad screw so there's not too much stress on it. And the key thing here is these are all based off the spinal pelvic parameters, so you measure them ahead of time, make sure they have things right. And this is a titanium rod. And so if some of it does kind of bend out when you place it, and that's okay. Again, it's just being thoughtful about the metallurgy to make sure that you can get things in the right place and get them all hooked up. And when you hook them into the pelvis, you can really retrovert, uh, or excuse me, anvert that pelvis nicely when you grab onto the, the ilium and uh, drive those rods forward with that cantilever maneuver. And that really helps you achieve that low, low lumbar lordosis where, where you need it the most. Uh, back to our patient. Here's some intraoperative films after we've done our kickstand distraction technique and locked in our uh, primary rods. Uh, this was an intraoperative film that we obtained. Uh, again, I like to think about our sequential distraction and compressions, trying to make sure that these screws are all parallel when we get our nice lateral here. Um, and I think that's kind of what Dr. Kleinberg was describing earlier. And then uh, we added our accessory rod after that point. So uh, overall, we were able to get his uh, PIL mismatched within 10 degrees. Um, at his three month follow up, he actually kind of settled in a little bit more and looks much more comfortable. He still has about a five to six centimeter positive sagittal balance, but I think he's feeling much better at this point. And uh, it's a pretty good example of how much uh, power you can get from this uh, simple little uh, rod distraction technique. So I think the take home points from this are that uh, you can use secondary distraction rods to provide provisional reduction. Uh, I always have to remind myself to make sure I get these iliac bolts medially along that uh, medial surface of the posterior ilium so that they're not prominent. Uh, that additional kickstand rod adds additional structural support. And then one thing we didn't go into here because it's not really the correction, but we had a spinous process tether where we use some Merceline tape. Uh, we'll use a sharp towel clip to pierce the uh, UIV plus one uh, to pass the Merceline tape through. And we use a uh, crosslink, tie the Merceline tape around the crosslink, and then use a compressor to add a little bit of extra um, tension on there to help uh, offload that upper level. Uh, the, the key thing, too, so I'm just going to make one point, uh, Steve, while you're talking through these is, you know, when you're distracting, that you have to be careful not to over distract because that will flatten that low lumbar spine. And so what you want to do is distract through that concavity and then compress on the other side to reachieve the lordosis. And so it's really a more of a rebalancing of the spine to get the lordosis rather than it is full distraction. You're allowing the vertebra space to rotate back underneath and get back in alignment. Um, so it's a little bit of, it, it's a little bit of both. And I've actually had the good fortune of doing this technique several times with Dr. Kleinberg. This is an example of a 68 year old male. We did a two level ALF uh, and an anterior column release at L34 followed by a T9 to pelvis uh, where we uh, took advantage of this technique. And there was also a 77 year old female. Uh, we did uh, multiple posterior column osteotomies, T9 to pelvis. I think this was more of a teaching case for me to get more opportunity putting in a pelvic bolt and uh, learning how to use it rather than necessity for uh, the power that it provides. And then a nice uh, adjunct thing is we've used this technique on a couple of cases uh, for just a supplementary rod where we add additional uh, pelvic bolts. 
this was a patient that uh, had some distal junctional kyphosis actually fractured through these L4 screws that we extended down. And because we didn't have these uh, screws to, or these pedicles available to us, it was nice to have some additional uh, support with uh, accessory rods uh, across that uh, unstable junction. Uh, last thing I would mention is we see a fair amount of trauma here at UC Davis, and I should have put this one in here, but there was a thoracic dislocation where uh, we were able to use a similar concept with the side-to-side -side, uh, rod distraction technique to help reduce that. Um, and it's uh, extremely powerful and a tool I plan to keep in my back pocket. Good. Um, so thank you both. So I, there's a couple questions from the audience. Um, what, uh, what do you guys think about experience with fusion, anterior column support in these patients? Do you think not having interbodies all these levels affects fusion, affect fusion rates? And so for both of you guys who've done a lot of my, uh, had the, the, the misfortune of being in my clinics, how many non-unions and fractures are you seeing at those upper segments where we don't put lateral interbodies at every cage, every, every level? I don't think I've personally seen any of yours. I've seen a couple throughout my training, um, but I mean, you use some BMP, you get out to the transverse processes, deep corticate those and get a nice posterior lateral fusion bed for all that. Um, I think you're pretty meticulous about taking down the facet joints and making sure there's plenty of bony surface to heal too. So, uh, so far I've seen pretty good results for your patients. Trevor, anything to add there? Uh, it's, it's more like flat back deformity than like a scoliosis, but you, you'll use like the L5S1 for an A lift. It's, it's more to get the, the sagittal balance correction on something that has a prior fusion. Uh, it's uh, not so much to get an, a fusion rate. I, I don't think yeah. we got some problems, but fusion's not one of them, I don't think, usually. Well, it's, it, you know, like everything, if you've fallen out long enough, you can find problems. So I do think the inner body, I think the 5-1 level is. Uh, much more prone to fracture and late complications. So I do like having a, a, some sort of antibody graft in there, particularly if there is a disc space still available. Um, a lift, T lift, uh, P lift, I don't really care. Just something to get something in there because I, I do think that those rods see a lot of stress. And then I, I'm probably using more rods as I continue to go on just because I'm seeing those late fractures. Uh, and there's nothing that humbles you more than long-term follow-up. So I see these folks um, at, uh, you know, five years and uh, seeing a person at five years who then has a rod fracture and you got to take back to the operating room kind of sucks. So um, I've started using more implants down with those accessory screws and rods. Um, I don't think it impairs a fusion rate because I do the fusion before I put that final rod in um, and then still get nice packing of bone on the postal gutter. Um, and then uh, Steve, one of the other questions was PJK prevention strategies besides Mersaline tape. Anything else we do? Uh, I think the things we mentioned already, we try not to put too much stress on it in terms of compression distraction or reducing things to it. We'd like the rod to fall into it. So sort of that soft landing concept. Um, I think those are the biggest things that I recall. I'm sure there's more I haven't picked up on. No, I think that's exactly right. So, so you really, those top screws, uh, you really don't want to see any stress. So uh, the, those get final tightened at the very end and we're just setting a set cap on it. Usually the rod is pressing down into the tulip. And so there's no reduction, there's no compression, there's no distraction. You really want to just wanna have those sit where, lie where they are. Um, and then we use a Mersaline tape to kind of uh, uh, use the in instrument, the UIV plus one. I think, you know, getting these things balanced and aligned properly is also as important, if not more important than the Mersaline tape, quite frankly, it's hard to know which one makes a difference because I've kind of done them both at once. But I think the better aligned and more balanced you are, the less likely they're going to want a PJK because they're not pulling against anything. Um, and not overcorrecting. Exactly. Not, not over or undercorrecting, right? There's a little bit, you've got a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, but I think, yeah, you want to be careful. If you overcorrect them, then they're going to want a PJK forward. If you undercorrect them, uh, then they're stuck in this, you know, uh, this uncomfortable flat back position, and then they uh, junction junction over that top. Um, sure, sure. 
Trevor, did you have something to add there? Sorry. Oh, uh, I think you use a little bit beefier screws uh, by a, a little bit, and uh, you know, you use titanium, but you still use that uh, thicker rod than most people do. Um, I think that yeah, these are six three five rods, cobalt chrome. The, those, yeah, and uh, what else? I mean, the surgery map, just kind of planning it out, and uh, I think the other thing that we do pretty good is is or we're pretty critical of the uh, upper levels and, and how junky they look and how the sets look like and uh, I mean whether you need a CT or an x-ray or something but just getting a feel of what's getting back to normal um, and I think that might answer the next question which is you, if there's uh, normally we go to T11 I think but if there's something that looks bad and we're happy to you know T9 or T8 or something you know yeah, I think in, what I really look for is I try to, um, so I want the verter to be neutral as much as possible because I think that allows me to get things corrected. But I'm not very uh, algorithmic. So so I don't care if that's 11, 10, 12, 9, 8. Any one of those is perfectly fine for us to end at. Um, and then the other thing that I look for if I can is if they have an osteophyte and they're trying to fuse at the level above that I'm fixing. So there's an osteophyte at 9 and 10. But I love stopping that at 10 because that T9 level is already kind of getting stiff on me. And so I feel like that helps prevent, um, uh, prevent some of that uh, distraction, uh, prevent some of that proximal junctional failure, which I think is, uh, uh, can be pretty helpful. The last um, thing that I, I don't think, think we've mentioned is that you're very meticulous about making sure we don't violate that upper facet capsule. So we take them, we take our time to identify our levels. And then at that most cephalad facet, uh, we will not use our bovi to clear it out. We'll still find our landmarks, but uh, make sure that we don't violate it and encourage that breakdown of that joint. Yeah, I think that's a, a agree. We want to maintain, again, you want to find the normal anatomy, but you don't want to, uh, to violate it. That, that takes, takes a bit of time to kind of understand and get right. Um, I think there was a, you know, the last question here, can you describe the construct and distraction technique of that trauma case? Essentially what you saw earlier where uh, we grabbed on to distal segments and proximal segments and just used a rod to rod distractor across them to get things uh, uh, lined up and corrected properly. Um, it's a, it's I might be able to pull up a quick picture of it if you're interested. Yeah, sure, if you have it, if you have it right there. Um, I'm, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Steve. Share screen. This is you. I like you showing off. Uh, so here you can see something doesn't look great. Uh, he's dislocated, I think, T5 on T6. Um, interestingly, this was what I was texted by the on call resident, and when they told me that he had some motor function, I questioned very aggressively whether that was true. Um, but in fact, his posterior elements are actually still intact. It was all sheared off the pedicles right about here. You can see the body sitting over on the patient's right. The double so that was the, the injury. Sign is a good, that's a good thing to memorize. Uh, so here's an example of what we did. We instrumented three levels above where the pedicles are still intact and two levels down below where they were intact. And we did this uh, side to side with the domino, again, rod, rod distraction. So uh, here's one of the bodies. Here's the other body. So you can see it's almost 100% uh, displaced here. And then we gradually reduce um, by you can see we ate up all this rod here and then we're going to eat up this portion of the rod with distraction. You can see here, here we're getting closer. Uh, lock it in with the contralateral rod. So there's that corner of the body matching with the rest of this vertebra. Um, and it, that was the reduction that we got. So pretty satisfying. This is like a 19 year old kid who uh, was ATVing with his buddies. He was asking when he could start deadlifting again. He said he was deadlifting nearly 500 pounds before this happened. Um, we got a nice little CT scan to make ourselves uh, 
be sure we didn't leave anything in the canal. He actually, I think you said he walked into clinic at his six week post-op with uh, just mild weakness on the right side and full motor strength on the left side, which is hard for me to believe, but you can see a pretty nice correction overall. Yeah, he, he kind of a brown succord, which is if you're gonna have a spinal cord injury, that's the one to get. And so he's, he's making a nice recovery. We'll see where he ends up, but uh, he's making a nice recovery. And, uh, again, just using all the techniques that we've learned to kind of bring, bring it back together and allow, uh, allow this uh, young man to heal together. Um, you know what, we made it to the six o'clock hour. The, um, I'd like to thank all the participants for all of your questions and engagement. I appreciate it. My, I've got a bunch of text here that I need to answer. Most of them are fairly friendly. <clears throat> um, and then uh, Trevor and Steve, thank you very much for all of your work. Uh, putting that presentation together. I think the video is actually very nice to kind of get a sense about uh, what things look like. I, I think the AL will put that up uh, on the YouTube channel so you can uh, take a look at it some other time and um, uh, hopefully not make fun of any of us too much about uh, what we did or didn't do right. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session um, and enjoyed the, the live videos. I think they, uh, I think they really, uh, I think they were a nice addition. Um, I think Mackenzie is going to put up some questions for you for the final webinar stuff. Um, please go ahead and, uh, and rate us, uh, whoever you uh, feel is most appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, again, hope you guys all have a wonderful evening and thanks.